Hey everybody. I am here today to talk to you about having multilingual websites. So I know you're all building websites this week and if you have access to the chat here, uh, tell me what you're focusing your idea of what you're building your website on. So we can talk a little bit about what that might look like. So go ahead and type in the chat some of the purposes of your website. So if you're gonna sell something, if you're building a website that's a blog or you're gaming, give me some ideas of what you're doing. For a game, that's awesome, Serena. That'd be fun to do. Is it gonna be a video game or is you are you building some kind of game that people will purchase and play at home? One of the things that's really important when you think that you might be selling something or presenting information um, to a different to audiences out there. So you build a website so people will come to it, right? And you wanna make sure that people who come to it can understand what you're talking about. And one of the things that's important is that not everybody speaks English. So if you're building a website in English, maybe you want to have some things in that um, website that are also in other languages. So I'm going to share my screen and just kind of go through a presentation with you guys. I do want you to ask questions if you have them. Um, you can post them in the chat. You can, uh, there's a lot of different, different ways that you can uh, be in contact here. So the strategy of building a multilingual website, let's talk a little bit about that. There's a couple different things that you want to think about when you're um, building a multilingual website. So first is you have to translate your text. So what are you gonna translate your text into? So if I was in Europe, I might think about translating my text into Spanish, German, Portuguese, Italian, and French, as well as English, right? Because there's a lot of different people um, in Europe that are using those, those different languages. In North America, here in the United States and Canada, we might think about having them having a website in English, um, French, and Spanish because those are the primary languages that we hear in North America. So there's lots of different things you have to decide when you're thinking about having a website in more than one language. So the first one is to determine what languages are you going to translate your website into. So like if you're in Serena's group and you're building a game, who are you gonna sell that game to? And is if they're gonna buy the game or play the game, how are they gonna know what the game's about and which languages might you wanna present it in? The next is that you wanna make sure that the images that you put on your website are actually appropriate for the people who speak that language too. So that not only maybe there's text in the, in the image. So if you have text that's embedded in an image, you can't translate it directly. So you have to be able to replace the image based on which language you're serving up to the person who's viewing it. So you have to be able to swap that out based on what language they are speaking. And sometimes it's cultural. So you wanna make sure that if you are presenting your, your website someplace, let's say where they don't, they don't like women to wear bathing suits, but you've got a bathing suit in your one uh, on your website. So you might in, in a different language want to replace that with an image that's not in a bathing suit, for example, um, just because culturally it might not be appropriate. And then the last thing is SEO settings. And if you don't know what SEO is, I'll tell you it's search engine optimization. So when you go to a website and you search for something, it's how Google or Firefox or who, uh, you know, um, Safari know what you're searching for is they, all these websites have information that they can, those web browsers can pull out. So you need to make sure that your SEO isn't only in English also. So you wanna make sure that you're touching all three of those things. So like I said, how do you pick your language? So how do you pick your language? Depends on who your audience is. When you think about who your audience is, you have to kind of think about a lot of different things. One of the things you can do is you can use something called Google Analytics and you can go to, go to a Google Analytics tool board, uh, uh, dashboard. You can create all the Google Analytics you want for free um, and have the ability to do all those things, but you can search for terms that are important and you can search what languages people are searching those terms for. So if you know that you have a very specific thing that you're selling, maybe um, it's performance parts for um, speed 
uh, bicycles. So maybe you're selling things that are for competitive bicycling and certain terms are looked up frequently like in French because of the um, Tour de France that they have and also maybe in English and Portuguese. So you would see that those that that particular part that you're searching um, is often searched for in those languages. And so that would help guide you to know which language that you wanted uh, to translate your website into. So that's one way to pick languages. The other is if you are in an area like, let's say Montreal, where most of the population speaks either French or English or both, and that those are just absolutely primarily the two languages. So in, in Montreal, you'd wanna make sure that you had a website that could be translated back and forth from English to French. So some of it is location and some of it is target audience. So make sure you look at those kinds of things. The next thing you need to decide is if you're going to have somebody actually physically type it out and translate it for you. So somebody, let's say, let's speak, stick with uh, English and French. Are you going to have somebody translate by hand your whole website? And then you're going to type into your website all of the, um, the French translations, or are you going to have a computer translate that for you? Something like Google Translate, for example, and other translation services that are on the web and other tools that are available, whether they're free or not, and whether you're going to rely on those things on your website. So there's different ways that you can do that. And you can actually have a mix of computer and human translated. So for example, if you do use uh, computer translated machine translations for your website, you can always go back and review those translations and make sure that everything looks the way you want it to. Or if you don't speak the language you're translating into, you could hire somebody to do that or talk to somebody who knows that language and make sure that all of the nuances are covered in there. <coughs> and then again, we want to make sure that the cultural differences are accommodated for. So words have different meanings in different countries. And we want to make sure that everything that we put on our website is conducive to understanding in different cultures. So we're going to look at all those different things. And like I said, with translating images, it's super important. Let's see if I can get this to come up for you. So this is a website called uh, TuneCore. And you see right now it's in English. And it's this picture of this gentleman here, sell your music worldwide. If I switch to, I think, let's see if I switch to France, I get a different image. So now I have a different image embedded with English text, or I mean French text on top of it. So this is done using, like I said, the ability to change based on what you see at the end of the browser tab. So it says you know, tunecore.fr, and then you have the locale equals French uh, France. And so we have the ability to say, well, if I'm serving up this page in this locale, I'm gonna use a different picture. And that way I can control what my audience is seeing, what my site visitors see. So that's really important because if you had text embedded on everything and it was only in English, but you're looking at a, a website and it's been translated into uh, Portuguese, the English doesn't make a lot of sense in that case. So you always want things to absolutely follow and make sense. And then I talked about a little bit before about SEO basics as well. So we wanna make sure that we have the ability for web browsers to understand which pages are in English and which pages are in French and any other languages that we're translating into. So we're gonna have different URLs for different languages. And that's how you saw in this other one that it was the, it has that locale in it and it's showing that different information there. So it's actually a different um, URL dependent on what language we're searching. We call those the H, uh, href lang tags also are parts of that. So you can change the way that those references show up so that when Google does crawl the web and takes a look for those, we're going to see that in there too. And then there's also server side translation. So for separate language URLs, you see here we have country specific domain. So in, you know, in Canada, you have .ca, but you also have .com. Um, in the UK, it's .uk. In France, it's .fr. In Denmark, it's dot, uh, I'm sorry, Germany, it's .de. So it depends on what it is. So you can have these, you can purchase your domain for that country specific domain. But you can also use a subdomain. So we can have uh, de.example.com. So your website could be served that way. 
And then you could also have the subdirectories like example.com slash DE, which is what you saw in that TuneCore page that I showed you a few minutes ago. So there's lots of different ways that you can serve up those URLs. You just wanna make sure that they're always seeing a different URL based on the language that you are presenting to them. Then we have what I said before is those href lang tags. So that's gonna be that, that um, you'll see it here. So the alternate for this one would be, um, this would be the English would be the .com, the French would be the .com slash A slash L slash FR. Italian, for example, would be .it slash IT at the end. So you have different SEO links that are being found by Google depending on what the language is that you're presenting in. And then you have the server side translation. And what does that look like? So server side translation is when the, um, the, uh, the browser can actually find in your server those different uh, pages served different ways. It's not being stored someplace else. It's being stored right on the server. Those translations are happening there. So they are able to be crawled. They are, they are able to be found by Google. Um, they're able to be discovered and served up so that people searching in those different languages can find them. If it's not on the server side, it's not in your source code, it can't be crawled as easily and that's not gonna be um, as easy to find for sure. This is a website that I built um, for my podcast. And let me show you what that looks like. So when you first come over here, you can see that the whole website is in English. If I go to the About Us page, everything is in English here. But if I switch it to French, now the whole site is in French. And I can see everything through there. And I don't speak French, so I'm, um, you know, the, my best guess is that everything in here is the way it should be. But if I really wanted to, if I was really concerned about it, I would have somebody who does speak French go through and double check the way that this site um, is served up for me. And let me log into my Weeglot and show you what that looks like when you want to change your translations. So here we go. So I'm on WP Coffee Talk. That's the site that I was just showing you. And I can go to my translations. And here I can see my English to French. Let's take a look at those. And if I come to the about, the, the about page, you can see the automatic translation. So if I go back to the website over here, you can see here it says, Salut, je suis Michelle Fourchette. If I come over here, I can come down, I can see it says, Hi, I'm Michelle Ames. I changed my name. Salut, je suis Michelle Ames over here. So, but one thing I notice is that there's an extra space here between the salut and the exclamation point. So if I take that off of there and then I save it, oh, where did I save it to? I can come back over here afterwards and when I hit uh, refresh, it's going to have fixed that. Um, it's not happening in real time right now because I don't remember exactly how to do it, but this is how you would do those. Oh, here it is. Um, I've saved it now, so it's all saved. Come over here let's see if the browser has cleared the cache yet. And it hasn't, but eventually, uh, take a few minutes, that space is going to disappear. And I see there's one over here too, there's one over here. So for some reason, when I translate um, and it, with, from, here, from English to French, it's messing up where my exclamation points are. So I can click over here, it's saved now. And then eventually, like I said, it will catch up to me over here and those, those will all catch up. So that if I wanted to change a word, for example, I can do that too. So some of the words that I might say, so, this is, so grab a cup, you know, maybe I wanna use a different word for cup or I wanna use a different word for anything over here. I can do that. And when the server side catches up over here, it's going to then fix those words to the ones that I asked for. So you can do that with images over here. You can do that with um, all the words, you can add you know, ex you can add accents, all of that can happen right through here because it's being done on the server side and then served back over. So that's how um, I can make some very specific changes over to how that looks on my website. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is that, just pull this up over here. I hit my present on here for you. There's different reasons that you might want to have a multilingual website to grow a business. 
Um, let me just skip over some of these. Like I said, English isn't the only language. So according to the British Council, 25% uh, of the world's population has some understanding of English, but that means 75% of the world doesn't, which means that if you are only showing your website in English, you're really missing out on the possibility of having other people see what you're writing, see what you're selling, and be able to take advantage of what it is that you have on your website. Um, Nelson Mandela said, if you talk to a person in a language they understand, it goes to their head, but if you speak to them in their own language, it goes to their heart. But I'm gonna tell you, if you make too many mistakes in their language, they're gonna bounce right off your website because people don't stay on a website they don't understand. So you wanna make sure that you're using translations that make sense to people. You can build a bigger community when you actually speak somebody's language or present your website in their language. That um, multilingual SEO, like we said, helps you be found in more languages. Uh, you can use page builders easily and uh, decide how your website is displayed when you're doing that. It gives you greater accessibility to more people and it's friendly and reliable. It builds trust when people can see what you have in their own language. Um, it makes somebody feel welcome to your website. It's much more friendly. It's friendlier for people to be able to see what you're doing and what you're selling. Google Translate supports 109 languages. And so you can actually translate your website through services like Weglot, for, through other services that are out there um, into more than 109 languages because uh, Weglot doesn't just use uh, Google Translate, they use whatever the best translation is for, this, for the language that you're translating into. Sometimes that's Google and, some, and sometimes it's not. Um, according to Google Translate, over 100 billion words are translated every day. So you see how important it is to have a website that's translatable. Uh, there's countless times, though, that Google Translate misses what they're supposed to say. If you're relying only on Google Translate and things like that, you're probably making some mistakes out there. There are over 500 million users using Google Translate. And the most common translations you can see there, English, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, Portuguese, and Indonesian. Talk a little bit about that goodwill part I was telling you about. So language is very divisional. If you don't speak a language, you automatically feel left out. So if you come upon a website in a language that you don't understand, you automatically feel that you're left out of that website as well. So accessibility means more people can actually use the site that you're building. And so that um, having that foreign language there is helpful. Consumers around the world are excited to share common experiences. And they're one of the greatest common experiences we have is communication. And so if you can communicate with people, you've already overcome that barrier. Also, if you are selling something like the game, like a game or whatever else you might be selling, you're going to increase your sales if people can understand what you're selling. So it's super important that way too. Um, I actually bought a camera this year and I bought a camera from China and their website was translated from Chinese into English so that I could actually read what I was what I was purchasing. And it wasn't just and I didn't have to guess or go to another website and hope that all of the things that they were talking about matched up. So it's important that you uh, especially if you're spending a lot of money to make sure that you understand what you're buying. It'll increase your sales. La Machine Cycle Club actually increased their traffic to their website by 50% when they added two additional languages. And they actually have sold 25% more because they actually added those other languages. So it's super important to be able to let people uh, read your website in their language. Uh, like I said, the SEO will also increase sales. So if they're the browsers will crawl your site. If people are searching for something and it's on your website and they find it because the language matches, then you're going to have a much higher opportunity to sell to those people. It trans you can translate your content, um, do that multilingual keyword research, have that automated machine and human tra translation hybrid, make sure all those words that you want in there are perfect. And then um, you can see all the rest of these. So site domain, your uh, structure like we were talking about earlier. And then that ease of translation switching, like you saw with a couple of the sites I pulled up already, all I had to do was push a button and the, la and the language switched to the um, language I wanted to read it in. But trusted translations also mean reliability. So if I can read your site 
in a language that you've translated for me versus relying on my web browser to do it. Number one, that you've built trust with me because I know that you care about what it is that I'm reading on your website. You're not just leaving it up to a browser and a browser extension to hopefully translate it properly. Um, so it's super important, again, that you are building that trust with customers, especially if you want them to buy something from you, the people reading your website. When I, I put into Google Translate, nobody's perfect, right? So in uh, I, I was actually trying to read some different examples of when things, when Google Translate goes wrong. And there's a saying in uh, Spanish, el que tiene boca se equivoca. And that just means whoever has a mouth makes mistakes. Well, the English translation of that is nobody's perfect. But if I was relying on Google to translate that for me, they're going to tell me whoever has a mouth makes mistakes. And I'm gonna to have to try to figure out what that means. So that's why the human translation part of it is so important that somebody is able to read over what you write and make sure that what you're saying is what you mean uh, so that people understand it in their own language. Because we use idioms, we use um, phrases and things like that every day that we hope are translatable and they are but sometimes it's the human that has to know what those sayings are in other languages versus a word for word translation from a machine so again it gives you that friendliness reliability and trust and then we do use page builders so if you're using a wordpress for example and you're using like elementor or you're using um the Gutenberg block editor, you have the ability to move things around on your website and you can put things in the order that you want them. And that's important because some languages read right to left and some languages read left to right. So if you want things to be displayed as they are, um, using pairing a multilingual website with a good page builder will help you be able to style that site exactly as you'd like so that it looks like you want it to look when site visitors reach your site. So trust your translations with a hybrid of that automatic machine translation and then those controlled human translations. You can save money by not hiring translators every time you want to translate content. So sometimes people will spend a lot of money to translate a website into, let's say, French, and then they write another blog post. Well, now they have to hire somebody again to translate that page and post it to their website. But when you use plugins, when you use uh, translation services that are automatic machine, um, hybrids, then you can very easily just click a button and have that automatically translated. So you're not spending additional money every time somebody needs to, to uh, every time you add content to your website. Again, that ease of language switching. So I click a button, I sw pull, switch a pull down, I click a link and I automatically change to a different language. Um, you want to be careful, like I said, with automatic translation. Sometimes your browser goes on geolocation. So it's not an exact science. So sometimes my browser thinks that I'm in Toronto, even though I'm in Rochester, New York. And although we both, we, you know, it's English on both sides of that. If I was um, someplace else, let's say I was in Texas and it thought I was in Mexico, then it would suddenly translate everything into Spanish and I don't speak Spanish yet. So that would be a, um, something that's a little bit difficult. So make sure that you're not relying solely on geolocation for automatic translations. Again, review your site in multiple languages. Make sure somebody has eyes on it so that they know that it makes sense. And then just double check that your images, your icons, your colors, your date format, everything makes sense and it's translated for those cultural differences as well. So like I said, the steps are things like determine what languages you want your website to be uh, presented in. Choose your method of translation. So are you going to do completely human translation? Are you going to use something like Wiglot where you can have that translation happen automatically? Make a decision so that you can begin building a site and use consistency. Go ahead and implement that together. Like I said, verify and edit it. Make sure your SEO works so that people can find your website and then look for growth about what it is that you're doing. Um, I said, I think I told you my name is Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here today, but I do want to answer any questions that you might have too. So um, if you want, you can unmute yourself. You can type questions in the chat. I am happy to answer any questions you have about why you might want to have a multilingual website, how you can do it, anything that you might have 
Um, I also have been building websites for um, 15 years and I work in the web industry. So if you have questions about websites in general, I'm happy to answer those too. What are the best languages to use? Sweetie, that's a great question. And are languages that are more common than others? So like I said at the very beginning, the best languages to use are the ones that you think that your customers or the people visiting your website would need to have. So if you're selling a game, so let's see if you're gonna make a game and you want people to buy it. Um, let's, let's, it, let's say it's a card game so that the game itself doesn't have to have translations within it, but you wanna sell that game in Quebec and you wanna sell it in Ontario. And so you wanna make sure that you have your website in both French and English, because those are the people that would be your target audience. So you wanna look at that as far as the languages to use. There are definitely languages that are more common than others. So, you know, if you think about um, the area that you're in, that that's where you're going to find those languages that are more common than others. If you are in Europe, then your common languages are French, English, Italian, um, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, and then once you get down into you know Greece and the, you might have Greek in there a little bit. If you move to South Africa, there's a lot of um, languages and dialects there. If you're moving over to Asia, there's you know a a billion different Chinese dialects, Japanese, um, Korean, uh, Vietnamese. So it depends on where it is that your target audience lives. So let's see. Oh, you're welcome, Serena. And Jimmy says, would you recommend doing all the translations when you're first making the website or recommend them later on down the line when the site becomes more popular? I would recommend doing things all at the beginning. So if you want your site to become popular, it's more likely to become popular if people in other languages can find it as well. So if you only build a website in English and you don't add those other target languages to it, then it's not going to become popular in those other languages because people aren't gonna be finding it that way. And it's a lot easier to add those things as you build than to go back into a website and try to retrofit it with other things. So if you can do it all at the same time, you're much better off. You're gonna save time and headache in the long run for sure. Um, let's see, uh, there are websites that dynamically load their content from external sources. How does this impact SEO and how can it be translated using Weglot? So if you're, if you're having things imported from other um, other places and that's coming in, it depends on how it's sitting on your site. So if it's imported to your site and becomes part of your static content, so you've imported it ver versus you're hosting it through like an iframe or things like that. Um, if it becomes a static part of your website, then it is something you can translate directly and Weglot will absolutely handle that. It also depends on how that's coming in as far as if it's string translations and things like that. Uh, Weglot usually handles those fairly well. If it's something that is dynamic content, coming from someplace else, like you've embedded YouTube and things like that, it's not gonna be able to pick that up as easily uh, because it's not the content that's your content, it's content that you're serving in through another port. And so uh, it's gonna depend on exactly how you do that and where that comes. So it's, it's hard to answer that question without being able to see where you're bringing information over and how you're hosting it on your website. But that's a really good question. Other questions? Even if they aren't language questions, I can answer them. And I've been working with WordPress for years. So if, you have, if you're deciding to work in WordPress, I can answer those questions too. Let's see. Right now I have an Instagram page and run all my business through there. Pretty much 100% of my customers are English speaking and a huge chunk of them are Canadian. Do you think English and French would be sufficient translation options? Yes, Jimmy, I do. I think if you are looking at 100% um, of the customers are English speaking, but you have a chunk in Canada and you wanna make sure that anybody that might be coming from the French part of Canada, then absolutely I think that um, English and French would be sufficient for you for sure. A random question, what is the best way to expose your website to others? That is a wonderful question. That's a, that's a good marketing question. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. One is through SEO. So you make sure that um, on all of your posts and pages, you have at least 350, 350 words of content 
because that's what uh, Google wants to see when it crawls your website. Anything less than 300 words and it actually disregards it. You also wanna make sure that you're using keywords that make sense. So if you're writing about a game and it's a card game, for example, I, you're probably not making a card game, but let's just go run with that. Then you wanna make sure that you're working words you're using words like um, cards and you're using words like play and things like that that make sense, game, so that when people are searching for card games, they're going to find your website that way. But the other way is to absolutely use social media as much as possible. So, you know, if you are somebody who's uh, on Facebook, you can market through Facebook. If you are on Instagram, you can market through Instagram. You can use uh, TikTok. You can use Snapchat. Uh, there's so many different social medias that you can build. And one of the parts about doing marketing is figuring out which social media channels the people who are your target audience are using. So if you wanted to sell um, hair dye for 65 year old ladies, you'd go to Facebook. But if you want to sell a, you know, a video game to high schoolers and young 20 somethings, you're probably gonna to go to places like um, Instagram and Snapchat. So it depends exactly on who your audience is and where you're gonna market those things, but definitely social media and good SEO are the first ways to start working on that. Great, great questions. You're welcome. I got a question here that says, do you recommend translating websites if you're a small or local business? What benefits could translating your website as a local small business bring you? Um, that's a great question. It depends again on who your audience is. So if you are a local business, but your locat where you are locality has more than one um, population that are speaking more than one language, then you might wanna make sure that you are putting that in two different languages. So for example, if I had, a, let's say I had a store in a certain part of Rochester where there's a lot, there's a really big Puerto Rican culture and a lot of people only speak Spanish, then I'm gonna to wanna to have a website that's in English and Spanish, even though it's a local business. If I am in my hometown where I am outside of Rochester, where 100% of the people speak English, I might not be as concerned about having a multilingual website if I have a, a corner store here that I know that everybody that's patronizing my store um, speaks English. So then I might not actually even worry about having a multilingual site at all. It really depends on who that audience is and how you're trying to reach them. Wow, you guys got great questions. Other questions? I like this. This is fun. Ah, you all got quiet on me now. Any questions about anything to do with building your websites? Some of the things you want to think about when you're building a website too is like a form to collect information. So if, pe if people can, um, if, you put a, if you put an email address on your website instead of having a form on your website, then sometimes you would have people who are going to start spamming your email address. So having a good form on your website is something that's really useful. Um, oh, Jimmy says, yep, have a, had a few people who are more fluent in French inquiring about items a few times, managed to communicate them in English. That's true, um, but we'll definitely keep that in mind. Great, great ideas, Jimmy. Um, and with Weglot, if you're using a WordPress website, you can actually translate a website of up to 3,000 words for free. So it might be something to play with and see how that looks um, in English or French if you're doing something like that. So just an idea. Uh, let's see, what else was I gonna say? Um, having good images, making sure that your file sizes are good on images so that your site loads quickly because um, load speed is super important. People bounce off of a website really fast if it doesn't load well. Making sure that it looks good, not only on your computer screen, but definitely on your phone too. I know you guys are on your phones. I'm on my phone all the time. And if a website looks terrible or it's just doesn't size well and it's difficult to read, I'll bounce right out of that website real fast too. Um, so making sure that those kinds of things are, are in place are super important. I say super important a lot. I don't know why. Um, but those kinds of things uh, you want to really pay a lot of attention to. Also colors and fonts. You guys are young. So like sometimes you'll like you'll start to build a website and the um, default font is, you know, like a size 10 or 12 font and it's a version of gray. That's great if you've got good eyes. But for me, 
in my 50s, I better have it be a little darker than, a, than just gray and needs to be a little bit bigger than a size 12 font if I'm going to be able to see it on my computer. So think about who your audience there is too. If you're not just targeting people who are younger, make sure that your font sizes and things like that make sense so that people of all ages can see and take in everything on your website. The last thing I'll tell you about, unless you, and, and of course, keep push, pushing questions in there if you have more, but then we do have something now called web accessibility. And I don't know if anybody's talked to you all about accessibility, but web accessibility means that people who have disabilities, when they come to your website, have less problems um, navigating through your website. So things like font sizes and, and, and colors, like I said, but also that if you, let's say you have text on a button, but if you put red on blue, that's very difficult for some people to read, especially people who are colorblind. So you wanna make sure that you're using colors that have stark contrast, like white on dark or dark on white. Those things are much easier for people to see like on a button or on images, things like that. And then also that if you are putting pictures up on your website that you're using alt text for your pictures so that somebody who is blind is working on your website, the screen reader that will explain the website to them when it gets to the image won't tell them what the image file name is like sometimes an image file name is just a bunch of numbers that doesn't mean anything. So if you have a picture of a kitten in a basket put kitten in a basket and so when the screen reader gets there it'll say photo of a kitten in a basket and that person well, exactly. We'll know what your website's about. Oh, Serena has another good question. Is text-to-speech a good idea for your website? What are the good sides and the downsides? So text-to-speech um, is can be really good. It depends on how you're doing it and what you're using it for. But using a screen reader that will read the text to people, you actually have the ability, There's um, if you're using Chrome, there's extensions to do screen readers right there. And you can install one on your Chrome browser and you can play, you can click to see what it looks like when somebody visits your website, what they hear instead of seeing the text on your website and how it's navigated. So that's a great idea to be able to do that. And then, um, you know, to build a website, there are people who actually build websites using um, speech to, to text and that kind of thing too. So it just really depends on what, what it is that you're looking for and how you're looking to implement it. Um, but there, you know, there's ways that you can input input through voice. There's ways that you can hear the screen, read things to you. And those are all super um, exciting things to kind of play with and to see what it's like when somebody who has, uh, you know, who's blind or visually impaired visits your website. The other thing you want to make sure is that you don't have things auto playing loud, like noises uh, that might startle people, especially if there are people who are autistic, neurodivergent, come up on your website and suddenly it's loud and um, overpowering to them because the sensory inputs can be too much. As well as just sometimes like, let's think like you're maybe in your bedroom at night and you're looking at websites and suddenly like your room is blasting information <laughs> and music and your parents are just down the hall, you know, so um, you could be waking up people in the house. So making sure that people have the ability to control uh, what when things play and what the sound level is on their computer also is important to pay attention to. You're welcome. Any other questions? I don't want to just keep throwing information at you. But if you have questions, I'm very happy to answer them. So I know you guys have a really busy weekend. I hope you really enjoy this hackathon and everything that you're doing. Um, you know, I would love to see some of your projects at the end. Hopefully I'll get a chance to look at some of those. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, you can, if you're on Twitter, you can reach me at Twitter. It's at Michelle Ames. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, um, or you can talk to your workshop hosts and they can reach out to me through uh, Discord as well. I will be on and off all weekend, so I'll pay attention occasionally and see if there's things I can answer for you if you do have questions. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's been great to talk to you and I wish you great success through this weekend. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. You're welcome. Have a good weekend.